this tutorial video for training confronting conflicts. My name is Enav. I'm one of the authors of Confronting Conflicts and also I'm on the team dealing with the conflict and resolution content area in 2015. Before you get started, I recommend that you read the resource so you are familiar with the frameworks. Um, you can find Confronting Conflicts in a soft copy in PDF version on the CISV Resources website, or if you just Google Confronting Conflicts, that PDF should, should pop up and you could download it. So this is a CISV resource that was introduced in 2010, so right before the previous Conflict and Resolution theme year. Um, and the, the idea behind it was that we discuss Conflict and Resolution in CISV as a bigger theme um, we talk about global conflicts, or we like to think that we do a good job solving conflicts, but often we don't have the tools to handle more day-to-day -day interpersonal conflicts that come up in our international programs, that come up in our chapter and local work. And so Confronting Conflict aims at giving CISVers um, the training and guidance, but also a common terminology that they can use in CISV programs. So beyond just giving the tools, to give this common language that everyone can use, no matter what your mother tongue is. Um, that being said, it's important for me to point out that there's no, I mean, obviously there's a lot of material about conflict uh, management out there, and there's a lot of different frameworks that use slightly different terms. Um, and our goal is not to say that the confronting conflict frameworks are the truth, but again, having different CISVers coming from different countries be able to use the same terms is helpful. I like to start out the session um, by bringing people's attention to our emotional reaction to the concept of conflicts, uh, which is usually negative. We, most of us don't like conflict. We don't intentionally try to be in conflict and when we face conflict we we don't enjoy it um, so bringing people's attention to the negative connotation that we tend to have with conflict and then inviting them to be open-minded to a different attitude towards conflict as we proceed with the session um, one way that i like to do it is just to do a simple brainstorm at the the beginning of a session ask people to close their eyes and think of the first words that come to their mind when they think of the word conflict and then have a few of them share um, and most times that I've run the session I found that the majority of the associations with the word conflict are negative there's two key takeaways and you can see it on the slide that is important to point out the first thing is that what we are afraid of, the negativity that we associate with conflict, is actually negativity that has to do with the outcome. The reason we don't like conflict is that we are afraid of the possible outcomes of conflict, which can actually be very scary and uncomfortable, whether it be, you know, like a bigger scale conflict of war and violence, and whether it be an interpersonal conflict where the outcome can be that we lose a friend, or in a CISV context, that um, we have a bad program or we are unable to achieve the, the goals of the program. So that's really the first point that I like to make early on in the session. Um, and then the second point that I like to make is to, to really help change people's attitude is that conflicts, if they're handled well, could actually help us build relationships. If we manage conflicts in a constructive way, then we're not only um, undoing damage that a conflict that happened created, but we're actually leveraging the conflict to build something new. I often like to draw it out um, on paper on a board and to draw like a, a graph with numbers on it and say, let's say we had a relationship that started out at seven and then we had a conflict and that kind of set us back to a three or a four and um, good conflict management or resolution is not just about getting us back to the seven, not just about undoing the damage, but taking that conflict and using that as a way to get us past the seven to the eight, nine, ten territory. So really conflict as a way of building friendships and not just a way of, of um, doing damage control. 
The first framework that I often introduce is the building blocks framework. I think you should not spend more than a couple minutes just introducing the concepts here. Um, there are three building blocks which conflict and resolution can't um, exist without. The first is self-awareness and really just being aware of um, yourself but also the environment and people around you um, and really being honest about how you're feeling um, within the conflict. The second stage is communication, of course, that um, in order to have conflict and resolution that is healthy, you need to have a, a dialogue, you need to be willing to openly communicate how you're feeling in a conflict, and then, of course, there's the question of effective versus non-effective communication, but that is explored later in the session. And then the third step is um, just being open to actively listen being open in the sense of being open-minded to the fact that someone has experienced the situation differently than you. Um, so those are the three things that are uh, that, that need to happen in order for us to really um, constructively resolve a conflict. The ingredients framework is elaborated on in the book, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. The main idea is that every conflict has these three things involved, facts, feelings, needs. The facts, where what you want to stress here, it's just that it, it's, it's the, the absolute objective facts and it's completely stripped of interpretation or the flavor that different people like to add to it. That explains the tofu reference that it doesn't necessarily taste like much on its own but it really soaks up the flavor that each of the, each person that's cooking gives to it. Um, and then because facts are completely objective, you should be able to agree on the facts. Um, the feelings are the flavor that we add to the tofu. That's our personal in, uh, interpretation of the fact of reality and what happens. And we really, the way we as subjective individuals experience the world is usually through our feelings through our filter or lens through which we see the world. Um, needs, what you want to stress here is that we all generally have the same needs. We have different sensitivities towards different needs and, and, um, and that usually is what triggers a certain feeling. If there's a need that was unmet, that would trigger feelings. And that's what this slide is about, when you have needs and they meet a set of facts and that generates feelings. It's really important to keep this training um, somewhat interactive because there is some lecture element to it when you're describing the different frameworks. So I think it's great to have uh, an exercise um, to help them implement each, each different framework. The ingredients exercise that I have used is giving, dividing them into small groups, giving each group a set of facts that you write uh, in advance. Uh, that has two characters in it and then ask them to read the set of facts and write two stories, one for each character. So it's very important that each group actually writes both sides of the story because um, that's part of the exercise. Um, you usually give them about 10 to 15 minutes and you know to keep it light and funny I sometimes let them act out uh, I, I ask for, for a volunteer for each character and then have them tell the group uh, their perception. Also, give, I give them creative freedom. I tell them, feel free to add details that are not in the text and to really, you know, let your, let your drama side come out just to keep it light and funny. The key takeaways from this exercise is that, um, you know, it's, it's, relatively easy to come up with both sides of the stories when you're not emotionally involved. The first thing you need to remember is that when you are emotionally involved in a conflict, it's much harder to see a different perspective than your own. So the first thing it means is that you have to practice, practice, practice. It doesn't come naturally. Um, but it also, I mean, the good news is that it shows you the value that you could add as a facilitator or as a third person in a conflict um, and this is particularly important in a program setting when you are one of the staff or you're a, a leader and you see two other people entering conflict 
you actually can really help them as someone who's not emotionally involved. Even though a lot of us don't like to get involved because it's none of our business and it's not our conflict, this exercise should show you how you could actually add a lot of value since you're not emotionally involved. The next framework is the approaches framework or the hit run stand. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. The hitter is the one that is visibly in a conflict. They're not necessarily literally hitting, but they're the one that wants to be right. Their communication is aggressive and ineffective. Um, they are usually not afraid to confront, which is the good thing about the hitters, that they do confront the conflict. It's just that they don't confront it uh, constructively. The runner is um, the animal that comes to my mind is the ostrich, the big bird that puts the head in the ground. Um, that's the person that just does not want to be involved in the conflict. The good news about the runner is that they really, really do just want everyone to get along. So they are peaceful at heart, but the way they run from the conflict doesn't actually resolve it and often um, leads to escalation. And then the stand, of course, is what we strive to be. Um, that is where you are acknowledging there's a conflict, you're being aware of your feelings and what the facts were, and you really want to understand what the needs are of both sides. Um, it's kind of like a yes, no, maybe setup, except instead of yes, no, maybe, um, you put three signs across the room, hit, run, stand, and then you read out certain situations. Again, there's um, situations that are available in the training template you can tweak and add and change to make it more customized to your audience um, but the idea is that you read out a certain brief situation and ask people to walk over to the sign that represents the approach that they would take and invite them to be honest there's no right and wrong answer the last thing to point out is um, in the slide that you see on the screen is um, the, the relationship between the approaches and awareness, which is the first building block. And the idea here is that um, although you want to strive to stand right away, uh, awareness is really important because you need to understand who you are and how you react and work with that. So if you are, if you know that you're usually a hitter and you get really angry really quickly and it takes you some time to calm down, don't rush yourself um, into resolving the conflict in, that, in those hours that you're really angry because it's very likely that you will make it worse. So if you know that about yourself, you can give yourself those few hours to calm down and then proceed to standing uh, versus pushing yourself to stand before you're ready and actually making things worse. And then the key takeaways uh, for approaches is that um, one person can have different reactions and you will often see that people move around during the exercise so it's not that one person is one approach um, and then again being aware of the approach and striving to stand in the book there's also a discussion about escalation both external and internal um, I unfortunately don't usually have time to go into that in in a training session where, where it's one training session. I think for programs it's actually important if you're training staff or leaders of a program it actually is really helpful because it helps them be mindful and be able to identify escalation steps when they're happening. So um, if you have time and you want to draw it out on the board or add another slide, it's helpful to just quickly run through the different steps and the difference between external and internal escalation. Um, and it ties very well into the effective communication part because the idea here is that if you uh, use communication in a bad way, if you're non-effective with your communication, it actually leads to escalation. So you have to be really mindful of how you communicate because it really could be the difference between you know, escalation on one hand and resolution on the other hand. Um, the exercise I have used in the past is just um, putting up a paragraph that is ineffective in many different ways and then asking them to point out 
what is ineffective about this paragraph. If you're working with a very big group, maybe you can have them work in smaller groups to identify what's ineffective. If your group is not that big, you could do this part all together. Um, you can feel free to write your own paragraph here. Um, just make sure you include certain things that are escalation steps, like um, you always make me feel um, the whole I statement part, make sure some of it is phrased in non I statement form, and then maybe one or two things that are below the belt just to give uh, the participants opportunity to identify some of these things. Um, and then I, you know, you can ask them to rephrase it if there's time and write, write the same idea in a more effective way, or you could just show them um, what a better way to say it would be. Uh, the key takeaways for communications is that it's really better to just focus on what you need when you're communicating because it makes it less about he said, she said, and less about blaming each other and more about yourself and what you need from the other person. And then again, the book has guidelines for effective communication, which there's usually not time to go into, but, but you can point that out or, or show them in the booklet. I, I like to end the session with um, the guidelines for managing conflict, which gives a nice um, summary and overview of the process. It's also at the end of the book. Um, so the guidelines are, you know, first of all, make sure that you're ready to stand and that you're not in hit or run mode. Um, break down the conflicts, try to understand what the facts were, what your needs are, um, and then when you're ready to communicate effectively, do that. And then step four is also very critical that sometimes people skip and that's um, make sure that you also listen, that you listen actively and that you're open-minded to hear what the other side is saying. Um, once all sides feel like they have had their chance to express themselves, then you can move on to step five, which is uh, brainstorming for solutions. It's really important not to rush into step five. Um, a lot of times people that don't like conflict and tend to be runners are uncomfortable discussing a conflict. And so they try to rush to, okay, what can we do to, to make sure it doesn't happen again before all the other people involved have had a chance to really feel like they've gotten things off of their chest. So just keep that in mind. Don't move to looking for solutions until everyone has, feels heard. Um, and then, of course, uh, a good solution is a win-win solution that everyone is comfortable with. And then step seven is often overlooked, and I think it's really important. If you actually go through a process of conflict management, it could be very emotionally draining. It can involve tears and anger, and it can take a long time. And so once you've gone through the process, reward yourself, feel good about yourself so that you that you were proactive and constructive about handling the conflict and end on a positive note. It could be um, a hug train. It could be going around in the circle and everyone has to say something nice about someone else. It could be having a leader's activity that evening after you've done something. It could be eating chocolate together. So there's a million different things you could do, but it really helps bring that closure around the process if you're ending it in a kind of positive, inspiring thing. Um, and then of course you can point out that the resource is available, where they can find it, and if any NAs want to print it, there's a high resolution file available. Um, inform your trainees of this and encourage them to use it in their programs. Uh, another thing that's not in this PowerPoint but that the book does have is um, different ideas. First of all, it has guidelines for facilitating conflict, which is more useful for um, if you're a staff or a leader and someone other than yourself is in a conflict and how you can help them. Uh, there's also some ideas for how you can uh, structurally incorporate conflict into a program. For example, and, and 2015 is a great year to do that. For example, uh, appoint a conflict master, um, one of the staff, have them be conflict master and 
have that person check in with leaders and the other staff occasionally, or that, you know, the, the leaders can go to this person if they feel like something's going wrong, just to create that structure that makes pe people more comfortable. Um, do this training for your leaders in the first leaders weekend, for example, or for your participants if you're in a IPP or seminar where they're a little bit older. Um, have regular check-ins every other day. Ask, have people go around in a circle. How are they feeling? You know, is there any conflict that they want to bring up? Um, have an upfront conversation with everyone about their usual um mechanisms for coping with conflict are they hitters are they runners do they tend to stand just by having that conversation up front you you get to know people so if someone's in hit mode you're like oh yeah they said in the first weekend that that's their way and makes it easier to discuss put posters up in your leader's room or your staff room that has the guidelines for for managing conflict so that's something that you visually see all the time and that you remember those are just some ideas for how you can use this in a program. I personally have used this several times in programs that I've done and it's often not natural but so helpful if you go through the process where you're actually um, identifying a conflict, sitting people down, talking through the facts and then everyone says how they feel and then people identify what they need. Um, it, it takes time, it's not always pleasant but the outcome is great. So I encourage you all to inspire your trainees. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and the resource as well as a training template and the presentation and the exercises can be found on CISV resources. So thanks so much for taking the time and good luck with your training. Bye.